We're still talking about justification. Chasdik, to make tzedek, to make righteous, okay? A judge does that. Let me give you a tiny example of this world where these terms are used. Uh, two people appear before the judge. And this one says, he stole my cow. And he says, I never touched your lousy cow. And they start to argue in front of the judge. The judge watches them. Finally, he says, Surakalecha, justice is on your side. That's Chastik, he made him Sedek, by decree. He might be wrong, this guy might have really stolen it, you know. But uh, uh, he, uh, he makes him righteous. But now when God does this, you see, for instance, in chapter 15 of the book of Genesis, which is the key text that Paul always bases himself on when he's talking about justification, okay? You all know that, at least you would be familiar with it, you see? Uh, and so, uh, whoops, okay, after these things and so forth. And so then God appears to Abraham and he says, um, you know, uh, fear not, your reward will be very great and so forth. And um, uh, Abraham says, well, what will you give me? I'm going on in years. You know, my wife is going on in years. Uh, maybe you mean that my foreman should be my heir. God promised an heir to Abraham in his old age, right? And in her old age. When she left, the angel said, nothing is impossible with God. That's exactly what Gabriel told our lady, if you remember. So, uh, He's he's saying, you know, well, yeah, I know the, the law in that day, of his day, which is about 1700 B.C., was that if a man was dying childless, no son, his foreman could inherit everything. So, like, Abraham's trying to take it easy on God. I know you promised, but, you know, Eliezer's is good enough. And God said, no, not that one. The son from your own body. Now, come outside. Look up at the stars. Hard for us to imagine the scene because we live around with there's lights on and everything, unless you've lived in the desert or something. When we would go out to the desert when I lived in, in Israel, uh, you know, and you looked up at night in your sleeping bag, it's cold there, you know. The Arabs call the desert a cold place heated by the sun. So you're chilly, you're in your sleeping bag, and you're looking up at the stars. Billions. It's like a big black velvet cloth with all these diamonds in it. That's what Abraham saw. Not the couple we make out here and there between the clouds and the smog and the, and the street lights, you know. No, that's black and then star. So God says, count them, if you will. That's how many your, your uh, uh, progeny is going to be. And Abraham believed God. And that was credited to him as Surikah, the right way to relate to God. Well, what did he do? To believe like that comes from this word, Amen. Like our amen, amen, amen. Amen means to be stable. Uh, like so be it, we use each other. Amen means stability. You see, truth, which is also the word for truth, emet. In the, today, in, in Hebrew, you say it's going to rain tomorrow. Be'emet? Really? In truth? So, uh, Abraham sees all these stars. And he believed God. That means he made Hehemin, he made God firm. He didn't make God firm in himself. God's perfectly firm. He made God firm in his own regard, as, as though he leaned so far over on God that if God didn't come through, he'd fall flat on his face. That's faith. You see? He made God firm. And that was credited to him as the right way to relate to God. Surakah. Now, Paul is going to make much of this. Was Abraham circumcised or uncircumcised at this point? He was uncircumcised. And he's made righteous by belief. That's going to be Paul's argument, that it precedes the law, uh, righteousness. And now we have eternal life promised us. Eternal life. We're baptized. We're plunged into his body. We're one with the living, eternal, incarnate Son of God. And if we 
lean over on that truth, we have the right relationship to God. And we're justified. And that's Paul's point, you see. And so he takes Abraham, because Abraham, that was credited to him, you know, as surakah, as as righteousness. Well then, was he circumcised or not? He was uncircumcised at this point. So, you don't have to be circumcised to be justified. That's Paul's argument in this part of Romans, you see. But you have to believe. Well, you can't believe if you don't know who you're believing. So you got to pray. That brings us back to that whole thing I was speaking about in another context. I think the last time we were doing this, I forgot now. Faith as accepting a proposition and faith as communion. You can't lean over it and make your whole life depend on a proposition. But you can on a person. So faith has got to be, when it matures, personally leaning on God. And say, I believe you, God. I don't care what the circumstances. I don't care what. I know that you have promised and I can believe you. And that's righteousness. And that is worked by God in us. We can't do that. Nobody ever saw God. How are you going to lean on God? You see? Then Isaiah, when he's talking to Akaz in chapter 7, says, if you do not believe, you will not be firm. See, if you don't, you won't be Nehemin, you won't be Firmed, you see? So faith is relying on God. But relying on God's word is intimately linked to truth. And so, this is what is, they're saying in this text, you see? Uh, For the redemption in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as the propitiatory, the propitiatory is that golden plate on top of the Ark of the Covenant with the two uh, cherubim facing it. huh? And it's there at Yom Kippur that the blood is sprinkled, right? What's he saying here? The one who works this forgiveness of sins is Jesus. And he's spattered by his own blood. He's the real propitiatory. The ark was nice, but it was a ceremony. This is not a ceremony. This is for real. Jesus is spattered by his own blood on the cross. And that is what wins for us total forgiveness. So God says, in the name of the blood of my Son, I give you forgiveness. And you lean over on that, you're justified. And then you're baptized. And Paul is trying to drive that home. It's not this or that thing that you do. It's, you see, but it's it's relying on God but for real, it's not just a, 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 a you know a proposition. It's a person. Therefore, the faith has to be more than just acceptance. It's got to be communion. And the whole of the Christian life is is the secret, is the growth in faith. Growth in faith. Because that's the key to knowledge, knowledge of God. Now that growth in faith only happens with love. Why? Because, you see, we're assenting to something that we don't see. If I want to believe or assent to the fact that a body falls at 32 feet per second per second, no problem. I get somebody to climb up on the top of a building and drop a golf ball and I'll time it. And it goes down 32 feet per second per second. It's verified, right? How do I verify God's promise? Put him to the test. All gods are faithful to promises. God is... No. How can I do it? You see? I can't have that kind of certitude. I have a greater certitude. I have the promise of God, which is greater than all science put together. So this is Paul's point that he's trying to make in this section, you see? So, for the remission of see, operative through faith in his own blood in proof of his justice for the remission of sins committed formerly in the time of God's forbearance, in proof of his justice in the present time, that he might be just, that is, revealed as just, and justifying the one who is of faith in Christ Jesus, the faith in Jesus. God is revealed as just. Why? Because he's totally faithful to his promises. And if we lean over on those promises, you see, 
That's faith. That's why, and that faith has a certain amount of uh, confidence in it. Do you see what I mean? It's not just, well, I know you're smart, so if you say two and two or four, I'll, I'll take it. You know, it's personal. It's personal. It can't be just ascending to a proposition. It has to be ascending to a person. And that's why we have to grow in faith. So that we really do that. And we're really saying, I believe you, God, because we know him. And that's the secret of the Christian life, to grow. John of the Cross says that the the key, the essential moment in the dark night of the soul is an heroic act of hope because it's there based on faith we put all not on my righteousness not on I was good when I was three no on God well that's risky you know why it's risky because we don't know God if we know God and know his love and affection for us it's a lot easier to lean on him that's the secret of a life of prayer and growth in faith. If I'm going to relieve God, whoever he is, well, it's better than nothing. But that's assenting to a proposition. It's not assenting to a person. And so, growth in faith. And that's Paul's whole point there, you see? Uh, in this section, when he's trying to tell us this. Now, I want to finish this section the, on verse 27. Where then is the ground for boasting? It's excluded. By what law? The law of works? No. Rather, by the law that is the regime, like the law of gravity, it's a way, you know, it's a thing, it's a way of things behaving. By the law of faith. For we maintain that a person is justified with by faith without the works of the law. But once he's justified, the more he loves, the more he serves, the more he praises, you see, but now that are works of the law, the works of faith. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Does he going to just honor the, the Jews? Is he not the God also of the Gentile? Of course he's the God of the Gentile. If indeed God is one, then he must justify the, circ- the circumcision from faith and the uncircumcision through faith. They're coming from their whole tradition of faith. And the others are just coming to it. But for both, it's this act of, of entrusting yourself to God. I believe you, God. I believe you. And we can practice this when we start to pray. Just say, God, I'm scared to death, but I'm going to lean over on you. And if you're not there, I'm going to fall flat on my face. But I trust you. You'll be there. You'll be there. So there's that element of, of trust, even though faith is basically the work of the mind. But it's, it's got to go along with an act of the will. Why? Because I don't see what I believe in. But I know, and I'm moved by the Holy Spirit. You see? That's why St. Thomas says, see, there are two lights. There. There's the light of God and the light of my mind. And uh, what happens is that that light of faith is so desirable. It is so attractive. God is tugging on us. I will to believe. And, and, and it, there's an act of will in the act of faith. But it's not a, uh, I will. It's being attracted by God. And so that, of course I believe you. Even if I'm scared to death, you're irresistible. Of course I believe you. And that's Paul's point. You see, it's not our works. A lot of Catholics walk around saying, oh, I'm justified by faith, and the whole time they're only thinking of their works. Once we know the total freedom of God's mercy, we relax and can love him and love him back and become saints. When we know that, we don't want to cut corners. We don't want to kind of half make it. We want to give our whole lives to him because we have fallen in love with him. And that's the foundation for our the way we live, and that act of the will by which we yield to this light, even though it's not totally convincing because it's beyond our reason. That's enough. We'll stop there for today.